Welcome to the Women in Voice Summit. This is a three-day event where people from all over the world get to meet, interact, and network about all things voice. This is a real opportunity to build meaningful relationships while you're here. That's what Women in Voice is really about. Community. We encourage you to not only absorb the amazing content from speakers and workshop, but also interact with people on social media and in the Q&A Zoom rooms. If we were in person, you might talk to the person sitting next to you. We recommend you be social here also. You ready? Let's join the conversation. Welcome to the Women in Voice inaugural summit. It is a huge honor to welcome you to the first Women in Voice summit. I'll admit I've been dreaming about this day for a long time. And whether this is your first or your 67th event at Women in Voice, we are delighted to have you participate in our community. My name is Joan pulmoner Bajuric, and I'm the CEO and founder of Women in Voice. I'm proud to introduce to you Leslie Garcia Amaya. She's a Women in Voice board member and ecosystem partnerships lead for Google Assistant. I'm excited to have her today with me to kick off the inaugural summit because of our commitment between the Google Assistant team and Women in Voice over the past year, which we'll talk about in just a second. But first, Hi, Leslie. Hey, thanks, Joan. And hi, everyone. As Joan said, I'm Leslie, Ecosystem and Product Inclusion Partnerships Lead for the Google Assistant. Part of my role entails leading a program called Voice Talks, which is a monthly series presented by Google Assistant, where we bring you the latest developments of all things in voice tech. I also get to work on partnerships like the one Google Assistant has with Women in Voice to retain and grow the number of women working in voice which by the way, is a market estimated to grow to 26 billion by 2025. As Joan said, I'm also on the board of Women in Voice and I'm really proud of how far the organization has come in less than three years with more than 20 chapters in 15 countries. I'd love to take a moment for us to recognize how we got here. Hey Joan, do you remember when we first met? I absolutely do. We met in January 2020 at the Consumer Electronics Show just before the COVID lockdowns. And all these people from around the world were meeting in Las Vegas to talk about the future of voice and technology, much like today. And even then, we were partnering on work. Yes. And my favorite part of CES was the networking event that Google Assistant and Women in Voice co-hosted. The more I learned about women in voice, the more I saw alignment with Google's vision to build the assistant for everyone. Definitely. And you and I met and realized very quickly that we're both on the same page, super passionate about voice tech and about women's careers. And we talked about how women in voice and Google shared those goals and missions and eventually it led to Google Assistant becoming our first platinum corporate sponsor of women in voice, which we announced back in March. And um, the fact that we met at a conference frankly, has a direct parallel to today, right? This week, thousands of people will see our work and hundreds will come to the summit. Um, you can meet through the Whova app, uh, Zoom QAs, social media is gonna blow up, um, you know, reach out on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and meeting people, frankly, can really change the course of our lives, literally, like we're seeing today. Yes, and speaking of international showcases of women, this year at Google I.O., I gave a talk about the women building voice AI and their role in the voice revolution, which featured you, Joan, in addition to several other women shaping and influencing the industry. You know, one of the reasons people were excited about the talk that I gave is that when we expose accomplishments of women leaders in our field, it helps with retaining and recruiting more women to careers in voice. We're going to be putting a big, big spotlight on the innovation women are leading in voice over the next few days at this Women in Voice conference. That's right. And that's why the Women in Voice mission is to celebrate, amplify, empower, build community, and provide professional development resources to women and minority gendered folks. Well, what does it mean to you to be a Women in Voice, Leslie? You know, for me, it's pretty simple. We know that we build better products when we have diverse voices at the table. And we know we have a ways to go in recruiting and retaining women in the field. And I'm so encouraged by the progress we've seen. And I continue to lean into this space because how rewarding it is to be a part of the change that I'm looking to see in our industry. What about you, Joan? Absolutely. Well, for me, it's kind of twofold. I see this incredible technological innovation 
that's going on that has huge impact through the voice field. And that also is kind of this international societal change where we champion women and we champion the talent around us through community and, and really on both sides, living into our values. So I'm deeply grateful to you, Leslie. You're, you've been an early champion of the Google Assistant Partnership with Women of Voice, as well as the Platinum Sponsorship in 2021. We are so excited to be partnering with you and the Google Assistant um, throughout programming this year. I have to say it's such a delight and pleasure to be partnering with you and your team. Joan, many of you listening in probably attended the first co-hosted event of 2021 between Google Assistant and Women in Voice a few weeks ago. We held a roundtable that featured three women game changers in the field who are transforming the future of voice AI. Nearly 100 women learned more about navigating their careers and making connections in the industry. Just one of many examples of how we partnered this year. And I think it's really important to highlight that the partnership has enabled us to expand our reach, connect with more people internationally, retain our thriving community, and enable us to throw this summit to connect with people virtually all around the world. So all around the world, people, um, it's really exciting to talk about voice technology and community and how people want to get involved. You know, Women in Voice today reaches over 20,000 people daily across our social media platforms and, you know, has reached hundreds of thousands across these really short, almost three years. So thank you so much for your support, Leslie, and it's an honor to be with you today. Um, now let's transition to the big event. Next up is our Google Assistant keynote. It's been great joining you today, Joan. I cannot wait for this day one keynote. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Well, I have the pleasure of welcoming everyone to today's keynote, which is a fireside chat. Today, we have front row seats for the brilliant conversation between two powerhouses in the field, Rebecca Nathanson of the Google Assistant Developer Platform and Dr. Rupal Patel. Um, Rupal is the CEO and founder of Vocal ID, a voice AI company that creates custom voices. It brings IoT and things that talk to life through uniquely crafted vocal persona. So think of like super sophisticated versions of Stephen Hawking's technology, right? I'm also honored to say the recent um, announcement that she is um, also going to be an ambassador of the Women in Voice Boston chapter. So if you're in the Boston area, get involved. Um, on the flip side, Rebecca leads the Google Assistant Developer Platform product team, deeply impressive, and the team creates tools and end user experiences that help developers build amazing visual and voice experiences for the Google Assistant. All right, Rupal, over to you. Well, thank you, Joan. I am thrilled to be here for the inaugural conference of Women in Voice. And very excited for this discussion that I'm gonna be having with Rebecca Nathanson today. To kick things off, let's do some intros. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, it's great to see you, Rupal. Nice to see you too. So Rebecca leads the Google Assistant uh, Developer Platform product team. The team creates tools and end user experiences that help developers build amazing visual and voice experiences for the Google Assistant. Rebecca has led product teams at Box, at Jobvite, at NetSuite, at Shutterfly, um, working across both enterprise, enterprise software as well as uh, consumer products and developer products. And she holds an, a BA in international relations from Stanford University and an MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Welcome, Rebecca. I'm so excited to hear more about your career pathway and to share that with the rest of the Women in Voice uh, audience. Yeah, Rupal, I'm super excited to be here today. Also, um, you know, I think I think it's it's funny um, when we originally were talking about doing this. The original proposal was you sort of interviewing me and then I, I learned more about your background and said there's no way it can be one sided because your background is so fascinating to me as well. And so I'm really looking forward to this being a conversation and hearing about your point of view as well. Well, thank you for your kind words. So well, let's get started. Um, so tell us what you've been doing at, at Google um, in the Google Assistant developer platform for the last 12 months. We know it's been a crazy time. Tell us what your team does and what you've been doing. Yeah, so um, I lead both the developer relations as well as the product management team. And um, collectively, we lead all of our efforts to support developers who build for Assistant. That includes uh, speakers, smart displays, as well as supporting elements of Android. So we have app actions um, that are available within the mobile system for Android. And so we're cutting across all parts of Google. And we work on tooling, outreach, documentation, APIs, everything that's needed for developers to understand how to build, 
understand why building for voice is important, understand the best ways to build for voice, and then ultimately build, test, execute, and deploy. Well, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so um, it is. I know you've had quite a career even before arriving at Google um, over the last 20 years um, as a product manager. So tell us about the other companies that you've been working at, about the what it means to lead a product management team. Sure. So, um, yeah, I'm not too sure I'm supposed to admit that I've been doing this for 20 years at this point. It certainly dates <laughs> me. But, like um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I fell into product management very quickly after I graduated from college, which is pretty unusual. And I worked for a series of startups um, doing individual contributor product management, which honestly is still a leadership role because you're creating the plan and the strategy that ultimately the entire team has to rally around. Mm -hmm. um, and I continue doing product management all the way through, not even during business school and after. Um, my first big leadership role while I was leading teams um, was at Shutterfly, where I moved from being an individual contributor to the director of the team. And we were doing a complete replatforming of the entire system, ripping out the guts from bottom to top. Uh, and so getting everyone on board was actually a really interesting challenge. Um, we needed to make sure that the marketing teams were in favor of what we were doing because they had to use it. The technology teams understood the level of change. Uh, and I think that that getting everybody together is a theme that's definitely run through everything what I've been doing. Um, when I left Shutterfly, I moved to NetSuite and led their commerce team. So that was more focused on the enterprise space compared to the consumer space. Um, and then I moved from NetSuite to Jobvite. And Jobvite um, is a smaller company, much smaller team, obviously, but still the same sorts of skills of gaining consensus, deeply understanding the customer, deeply understanding the users. They're not always the same thing in an enterprise space. The customer is the person writing the check. Mm -hmm. And then the user is the person who's actually, you know, clicking on clicking on the pixels. Um, and then from Jobvite, I moved to Box, uh, where I actually was in charge of admin and compliance. Again, a different persona. And so you see, I sort of bounced around from industry to industry, but the common theme is hard problems to solve. And that's what I really love. That's what gets my juices flowing, is the ability to dive into something that people have not figured out how to address and figure it out together with the team. And that cuts across customer problems, technology problems, um, or market problems. And all of it is really fascinating. Um, so, you know, again, I found the skills are really transferable. And I think that's an important thing to remember because a lot of the people listening today, I think, are maybe earlier in their career and thinking that they need this <laughs> single path into a career. And if you look at my background, there's definitely been kind of a meandering. Mm -hmm. and that meandering has gotten me to this place the same way that a straight arrow shot might have. And I think has given me more skills in some ways than I might have if I if I had gone that straight arrow shot. Yeah, so as you talk about, you know, there might be people in the audience that are, uh, that are early in their careers, maybe college students, even high school students, I hope, um, listening to this and considering a career in voice, how did you get to voice? Um, and and why voice? Let's let's talk about that first. The yeah. So why voice? Um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. Um, <laughs> I'm a big Marvel Comics <laughs> Universe fan. And so the idea of actually working on the thing that enables that that future of the Star Trek computer, that future of um, of Jarvis, you know, mm -hmm. early in the Marvel Comic Universe series, the, the whole vision thing that, that I'm not too sure I want a physical embodiment of the voice, but working on that future. I mean, talk about a hard problem to solve. I love the fact that sometimes when I'll talk to engineers about product ideas, their answer is the technology doesn't support that. Give us two years and our machine learning teams will have it figured out by then, or the natural language understanding will have progressed enough in 18 months that we can actually support that feature. But today, it's literally impossible. Being on the forefront like that is absolutely fascinating. So I think the ability of voice to support all kinds of accessibility options, everything from somebody who is unable to type to my four-year-old who's still not able to read, 
but is able to interact with a system simply by talking to it. He pretty much talks to everything with a screen these days and expects it to answer. Uh, it's because we've got so many screens in our house that do exactly that. Um, I think that's just super exciting for me. Uh, and so I think, you know, that's that's actually one of the reasons that some of the work that you're doing is so interesting is, again, creating that kind of accessibility, creating that kind of universality of all of the voice capabilities that your company is doing, I think is just really fascinating. Well, yeah, and I think accessibility is something that we often think it's so niche, but so many products start um, like universally adoptable products sort of start with a very special need. And then all of a sudden now it makes the world a better place. And so other people that are able-bodied also, or don't have those disabilities also use those same products. You think about earbuds, you think about so many discoveries that were started for a unique population in the beginning, but then all, we all benefit from that. Um, which I think is really exciting to, to think about how doing something for the good actually has a has a long term benefit for all, you know, in, in that sort of the vision. <clears throat> yeah, um, absolutely. So let's just let's talk about the, the path that you took for your career. I'm really interested to see how your background in international relations and then the MBA that you took later on um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business how that wove into the work that you're doing now or what it, how it benefited um, your career trajectory? Yeah, so, um, you know, graduating from Stanford in 1998, you sort of just got sucked into the startup world in the tech world, <laughs> um, you know, living in Palo Alto. Um, but I think the skills that it gave me were about critical thinking writing, crafting an argument. So international relations is a combination of kind of political science foreign language and uh, basically sort of, uh, you know, virtually every social science and economics type of thing you can imagine kind of all munched into one. My original goal was to join the foreign service. I got sucked into the startup world and then lifted my head up five years later and realized I'd forgotten to join the foreign service. Um, <laughs> and so then just kind of continued in tech because I was having fun. Um, but uh, all of the skills around crafting an argument are critical for virtually any kind of career as you're, as you're going forward. Now, the thing that I lacked was the tech credentials, the tech credibility, because that undergraduate degree was very, you know, very much non-technical. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, in the early, you know, early 2000, 2005 timeframe, that was a problem. Thank goodness it's less of a problem today, I think. You know, the, my employer is an example of that, where I would have been unqualified to be a product manager at Google, you know, a decade, two decades ago, because they focused on people with computer science degrees. And today, plenty of us have, don't have computer science degrees. Mm -hmm. But moving to Carnegie Mellon, a big part of that was to gain that kind of tech cred, because CMU is obviously a very, very technical school. Yeah. Um, but what it also gave me was the opportunity to work in an interdisciplinary environment. I did a program jointly with the School of Mechanical Engineering and the School of Design, hmm. where we built a product together. We worked with International Truck and Engine, and they gave us a charter saying, make the truck more like home. And that was all. And so I spent my time interviewing truckers at truck, truck stops when I was in business school learning to draw and craft our designs, building them in the metal shop, and then ultimately presenting them to international. They chose to patent it. Um, and so again, learning how to work with all of these different groups in an academic setting, and then being able to transfer that back to the product management work that I was doing, I think was absolutely, absolutely vital. Um, voice at the time was still very nascent. You know, we're talking, you know, a, fair amount of time in 2005. Um, <laughs> but I think that a lot of that idea of figuring out how to make something feel like home is, you know, that's very relevant because ultimately it's about understanding what people need and how people feel comfortable. And I think that's a critical part of voice going forward is it, we need to develop the you sort of average person's comfort with voice interaction, because I think we've kind of trained people in a lot of ways to view voice interaction in a more stilted manner. You issue a command as opposed to having a conversation. And I think that this idea of conversational interactions 
that's the wave of the future. You can't have the Star Trek computer until you have that kind of conversational interaction. And that's something that I'm really excited about us being able to build over the course of the next few years. Yeah, so I think that's just really exciting what you're talking about in terms of conversational design, because think about something that's so interdisciplinary, right? That, you know, it is sort of, you can't have, there are no disciplines today that have that as a major. That, that isn't a major in college, right? And so it, you do have to bring together people with different expertise to really make that happen. That's yeah, really and I have to say, when I, when I got to Google and discovered we had an entire conversational experience design department, <laughs> oh, my heart just soared. Um, it's just, it's, it's wonderful that we are sort of expanding our conceptual framework of the types of thinking that we need in order to build a great experience. So um, curious, when so, did that happen? Sorry, um, sorry to cut you off there. Uh, when did this whole, um, when did you start seeing a conversational design team? Uh, give us a sort of a timeline of, is that relatively new? Is that something that's been around for a while? So the, the assistant is a little over five years old, had its fifth birthday in May. Um, I think that we've had at least some amount of conversational designers for most of the time that assistant has been around, but the team has definitely grown a lot over the last couple of years. Um, and I think that it will only continue. Um, one of the original designers for the developer experience team uh, has actually moved to conversational design. So we have this wonderful blending of someone with a background in user experience design specifically for developers who now has moved into conversational design. And so she's able to, again, blend those two disciplines, which I think is awesome. And is that a push pull from developers as like, and also consumers wanting this? Um, how does, what is making the decision to have more conversational um, design in the, in the developer team that you're working with? Right, so I, th I think that a big part of it is the more capabilities we're able to offer developers, in terms of building more complex systems and more complex uh, applications and, and actions, mm -hmm. the more they need help to understand the best way to design the conversation. Uh, and that's everything from understanding based on a single intent, what are all of the utterances, all of the ways that someone might express that? And then take that, you know, okay, that, that's in English, expand it to multiple languages. What are all the possible ways that someone could express it that way? What are the appropriate responses? How do you make sure you're not always responding with the long form answer? At a certain point, you want a shorter answer or people are gonna get really impatient. Uh, and so all of these elements are ones that go into our offerings to developers. And ultimately they come from our conversational design team that understands the, the give and take of a human conversation and how to translate it into something that is you know, ultimately being run by a computer. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so I wanna hear more about you and your background. Um, so you're the CEO and founder of Vocal ID, but you started off as a professor and then took what you, you told me earlier was the longest leave of absence in history um, to, to start this company. And so I would love to hear more about sort of that, that path from professorship into founding a company, what made you decide you wanted to start this company. And then I'd also love to hear about the differences between the academic world and the, and the professional world, because I'm sure that there are many. There are, and there's also some similarities. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I actually sort of, I guess I, this would be my more like my third career, given that initially I was um, working as a speech language pathologist, which is where I got first introduced to voice technology. And it was actually voice recognition technology um, that I started seeing people with spinal cord injuries and those uh, with some other kind of disabilities were starting to use. And that's, that's really where I got turned on to this idea that there are ways in which machines can augment the capabilities, the communication capabilities of people with communication disorders. And so um, mm. at that time, I sort of naively thought, well, I mean, this is such cool technology. People with spinal cord injuries are using it. Maybe people with mild disorders of speech could also train a speech, synthesis, speech recognition system um, if the patterns of their speech were you know, consistently imprecise. 
as long as they were consistently imprecise, we could build a machine that could get used to it. Like think about a very uh, strong accent. When you first hear that person, you really can't understand them. But as you get used to them more and more, and as long as their pattern is consistent, you figure out that mapping, that remapping of, the, of their speech, right? And so mm -hmm. um, as when I was a clinician working with children with cerebral palsy, um, I, you know, I just became really fascinated by this technology, went back to school to get my PhD um, and thought naively that I was going to make a machine that learned to understand pretty severely disordered speech. Um, pretty quickly, I learned that that's not really how the technology works. And like, just like mm -hmm. you said, you know, I wasn't coming from a technical background. I had a master's in speech language pathology, it was a clinical field. Um, and so, you know, I had to learn all this speech science. And so my undergrad, sorry, my master's degree, the second master's I took to sort of get into the research area um, was very, very uh, speech science focused. And my PhD also ended up being sort of a combination of, of speech science and um, some electrical engineering. So um, it's really kind of interesting to me that oftentimes we think the path we're on, we've studied for six years, you know, um, you're in a professional field and that's how you define yourself. And I found that when I was even applying for jobs for my professorship, people would say, well, this is what you are. This is the field you're in, you know, and you sort of mm. putting you in a box. Um, and right. I sort of always wanted to resist that because my interests laid at the intersection of these areas rather than, the, that, rather than in one of these areas solely. Um, so, you know, when I, once I got my PhD, um, I was at Columbia University initially and then moved to Northeastern University in Boston um, to be, uh, to be sort of finally reunited after seven years with my husband, who was also there. Um, oh my what, goodness! <laughs> what I did um, at Northeastern is built this very interdisciplinary team um, of computer scientists as well as uh, speech and hearing science students, where we often solve problems at the intersection of these fields. Um, what we would do right. is take basic science research and then try to have the computer science students would try to build technologies that leverage those um, empirical findings. Um, and so one of the projects in our lab was on, on speech synthesis. Actually, the previous project was on um, creating a synthesizer that spoke like you and I speak when we're in a, in a crowded or a restaurant where it's loud. We call that loud mouth because we speak differently in loud environments than we speak in, you know, in um, more quiet conversational environments. So we sort of right. been dipping into this area for a while. Um, the, the jump over to um, ac from academia into business was when we finally started seeing that with Vocal ID, this technology to create unique personalized synthetic voices had, um, in, but this is 2014, 15, right? Really, we haven't seen the echo come out and so on, but we saw that many people were interested in sort of volunteering their voices after I gave a, a TED talk um, at TED Women in 2013. And that was sort of the impetus to say, okay, maybe we can make this happen. And kind of like I alluded to at the beginning where um, I'm definitely a believer of universal design, where if you create something for people with disability, I think that um, there will be applications for the broader market as well. Um, and that's really mm -hmm. how we jumped in um, and took, you know, starting the company, which is now quite a bit, you know, quite far in. We don't only develop um, custom voices for people who can't speak, but also for companies and brands who want a unique branded voice. Wow, that's great. So, so what surprised you when you jumped into this, you know, the, the startup world? Uh, you know, obviously, it's probably like jumping into a cold swimming pool, I imagine. Um, you know, bracing and shocking all at once. Um, so, you know, what what were the biggest things that you learned that were different or ways that you could transfer what you had already learned within the, the environment at Northeastern? I mean, obviously with the interdisciplinary elements you had, you were, you were already a good, good portion of the way there. Yeah. I mean, I think that the pace is really different in terms of discovery right. and then actually implementation. Right. So, um, when you're trying to solve a big problem in terms of in research, you know, there, there's a very different sort of a trajectory, the team size you have, and you have students that are learning very different than now you've got employees that are, have more training behind them. And sort of, you can, you have to implement something. So the productization of um, a technology was really the difference. Cause when you're in the laboratory, you're not trying to productize something. You're trying to solve a really right. hairy problem, but you're not looking at, well, 
how can thousands of people use this? The scaling part is really not in question. So I think the very first thing um, was, okay, this works, this is great technology, but technology doesn't make a business. What makes a business is the product. And a product is something that is usable and has, you know, by many and has, you've got to have input from the end user in a very different way than just the technology, um, you know, creation in the, in the beginning. So a lot of what we learned um, are really important lessons. So our very first customers were people with very severe speech disabilities. And because they were coming to us and saying, yes, we, we want a voice. And, you know, I initially had no ideas about creating a company, um, but we thought, there's so many families that want this technology, you know, um, after I, I gave that talk. And what we learned very quickly is that the accuracy of the voice, so making it sound really like that individual, was actually not necessarily what the customer wanted, even though they'd say they want the voice to sound like my child, right? But they still had um, a need for the clarity of the voice and the naturalness of the voice. So accuracy mm -hmm. alone wasn't enough. And that was a really hard lesson to learn to say, oh, okay, well, well, technically we've solved this really interesting problem, but now we also have to think about the user preferences and the user sort of what's going to make them buy. And that's very different from just the technical technological solution. Um, that took a while to learn, I think. <laughs> Yeah, that's def definitely a shift. Um, I even experienced it some in my MBA compared to, you know, within the academic setting versus versus outside, even though we were working with uh, um, with with a company. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, started with this in 2014, huge amounts have changed since then. Um, and it just changes constant in this world. So how have you managed to kind of stay on top of your game with all of the new skills and the new knowledge that have been both within the industry, within your discipline, et cetera? Well, it's like drinking from a fire hose, right? I feel like I sometimes say that um, this jump has taken years off my life. And other times I say, well, it's actually made me, you know, sort of turn time back because it's made me a student again, right? To be a student again of this work, in fact, the discipline of or the science around speech synthesis has changed dramatically in these seven years. When we first started, the synthesis that we were using or the technology we were using was concatenative-based synthesis or unit-based selection where you're gluing together little bits of speech. And you know, five, six years ago, the, the maturity of the deep learning methodologies or machine learning methodologies had sort of come along and we started implementing that. So, our team is, um, you know, our, our scientists and, and product and engineers that kind of know how to take that leading edge science and then implement that and productize that. So learning that has been, you know, partly why this is so exciting to me is because it's been there's been so much research in a field where there's, you know, continual development. So I think that's that's part of the lesson to be learned that. Um, you know, not every business is the same as well. And if you're creating a sort of a, a deep tech business, that backgrounds and research are actually very, very important to think about, you know, how you get that cycle quickly and how do you learn, how do you unpack mm -hmm. what's, what people are talking about in the papers that are bleeding edge papers. So um, it's really been an exciting area. And when I listen to the evolution of the technology over the last five years, and sometimes you sort of play a collage of these, um, an audio collage of these, it is remarkable the change has been over the past, last five, six years. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, yeah, I, uh, obviously you've been able to follow this over the course of time. I jumped in, you know, a little under a year ago, uh, not having a huge background in voice. Um, I'm incredibly grateful that the, the internal team actually provides us with industry updates and, you know, we, we get a chance to get access to all of those papers, but there are also roundups for other people out there like VoiceBot Weekly that gives you a lot of that kind of information. Um, and I think for me, I've, it's also been important for me to realize that keeping up, it has a lot of meanings. It's like you said, it's the, that deep research on the, the fundamental technologies, it's the movement of the industry, but then it's also about where there have been new, new, there's been new thinking or new discoveries around how you can be a better professional. And that's what, that's actually one of the things that I love. I, I'm just a huge organizational behavior nerd. Uh, <laughs> and so <laughs> 
I, I tend to focus a lot of my learning around organizational behavior, leadership learning, that kind of thing. Um, you know, some of these, some of the, you know, Kim Scott's radical candor, it's been around for a while, but I learn something new from it kind of every time I go back to it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm also a big fan of, I, I don't know if we're allowed to say this, but it is the title of the book, The No Asshole Rule by Bob Sutton, which was published years ago, yes. but I think is also super helpful. So, you know, for me, a big part of this is understanding all of my layers of where I need to keep up as it were. Uh, yes. So, yeah. And, and you find, I think the women in voice community um, is really going to be pivotal here as well in terms of, of, of letting uh, those of us who um, think about, you know, maybe come from different backgrounds, like how we fit into the bigger picture as well. And, and that it isn't sort of, you know, confined to, hey, you ha have to be a computer science, you know, expert in order to be, have a role in this field. Because I think just as much as the technology, keeping up with the technology is important, it's sort of keeping up also with what consumers and businesses want. So reading up yes. on the business literature, I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective, you know, are there, do you see this in the business literature, case studies and so on in voice that are coming out of, you know, the various different Harvard, Harvard Business Review often has some really interesting sort of trending stuff. We know techno, um, MIT Tech Review does, but there must be other publications as well that do some similar kinds of things to keep the professionals on the business side also engaged and in, um, you know, up to be up to state, sorry. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it is still nascent in a lot of ways um, on, on the business side. I think that one of the things that we're really, we're, we're crossing the chasm on now is building scaled businesses that, that center around voice. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have lots of startups that are doing amazing work, but getting to that next step of really scaling the business and getting to really big numbers that's where we are right now, which is fascinating, but it means that we don't have a huge amount of case studies to look back at. And that's something that we talk about a lot internally at Google is we are not just creating the future when it comes to the technology, we're also creating the future when it comes to how do you build a business around voice? Um, mm -hmm. There's, you know, there's definitely some really fascinating stuff coming out of various elements of the Google research teams. Um, every day I discover a new research team at the company. It's, it's, it's like, I feel like a kid in a candy store sometimes. Um, but yeah, I think it, we're going to see more of that as we go along, but I actually haven't gotten a huge amount. And if, if you can point to some, I would actually love to see it and we can uh, maybe uh, put some, put some links in um, after, after the keynote and give people, uh, you know, a reading list, give them a little bit of homework. Yeah, I think it's, like you said, it is very nascent right now. And I feel like um, what we're starting to see is after 2017, um, there were some more reports that came out. Like 2017 is, I think, of the year of the Echo, right? And then um, also right. Google Assistant. And like there's Google Duplex. I'd love to go back to that. You know, I think Duplex really pushed people's imagination in a way that we hadn't seen before. What can this technology do? It also, I think, alerted people to what are the perils of this technology, right? Potential perils. And so I think that there's... Um, now various different perspectives on this um, and we're also going to see from you know the voiceover industry and various other neighboring industries that this disrupts this technology disrupts what are the implications long term so um you know maybe we can spend a couple of minutes and talking about how people from different backgrounds maybe even law or you know psychology um they can think about what their roles in voice may be in this future of voice yeah, so I think going back to one of the things you said earlier, you know, there really aren't degree programs for conversational design out there today. Uh, and so I think that's, that's one of the most critical things. We are at the very beginning of this journey. Despite the fact that there are companies that have been around for a decade, we're still at the very beginning, which means that people to some degree can, can write their own passage into this field. There isn't sort of a, a set of certifications or a degree that you need to, to look qualified. And so it's more about, just like I said at the beginning, understanding the transferable skills. Psychology, oh my goodness, that's you know directly connected because it's, a, it's about how people think and the mental models that they apply to the voice systems. Um, because a voice is going to inherently have a personality, 
whether the creator of that voice wants it to have one or not, people are going to imbue it with a personality. There's a huge amount of mental model work that has to go in there. And people with backgrounds in psychology, people with backgrounds in any kind of user experience or any kind of persuasive or analytical type of background. Um, you know, rhetoric comes to mind. I know someone who majored in rhetoric at UC Berkeley years ago. I think all of those backgrounds can very naturally lead into this idea of what mental model are we creating and how do we make sure that everybody involved has a shared understanding of what's going on. Um, yeah. You know, I think that people, you know, people with quantitative analytical backgrounds, we have a really big team at Google that does a lot of analysis and research with qualitative and quantitative research. And, you know, the people who do that sort of thing in some cases have, you know, backgrounds in economics or that kind of thing where they had to do a lot of analytical work. But in a lot of cases, um, you know, obviously stats is transferable, but for the user experience research folks, again, it's coming from a lot of the more social sciences areas where you have to understand how to craft an argument, how to ask questions in a way that is not leading so you can gain the true understanding of what people think. And so I think there are paths into this field from all over the place, not just from the machine learning, AI, stats type of backgrounds, but from, from virtually anywhere. I mean, if international relations can get you here, I, I'm pretty confident that anything else can too. Yeah, and even art, I think, in terms of expression, when we think about, um, or, you know, oratory skills. I mean, I think there are lots of other disciplines um, which can give, which will inform the design in a way that if we just leave it to the technical folks, we're going to get something that works and it's functional, but that doesn't necessarily have the aesthetic qualities that we're looking for um, in a conversational system. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit more, um, more directly about just what kind of it, what kind of advice you might give your um, younger your younger self. Let, let's let's put yourself at at that decision making point of you know what you want to do with your life. Maybe 15, 16, you know, starting to think about that. Um, what do you wish you heard and what do you wish you didn't hear back then? Yeah. So one of the things, and I think I was like every teen teenager in this way, um, I needed to hear that people weren't paying attention nearly as much as I thought. And by, by that, I mean, they didn't notice my flubs. They didn't deliberately excuse, exclude me. They just didn't think of it. They weren't being in some ways, you know, deliberately mean. They're just clueless. And there's actually, there's even a name for this. I've been doing a lot of research because I'm going to be leading a session soon for our internal um, Women of Google assistant group around getting outside your head. And there's, you know, the name, it's the spotlight effect. It's the tendency where you misjudge and overestimate how much attention others pay to your behavior. And so you tend to overcredit your mistakes and assume everybody noticed them. I guarantee nobody remembers the mistakes and most people have interpreted what you've done, whatever it is, with a more positive quality than you have in your own head. Mm -hmm. And for me, that would have been one of the most critical things because I was always afraid that I was screwing up or that I was going to screw up. And it kept me from being quite as bold, particularly earlier in my career um, than I, I could have been and should have been. Um, as far as stuff that I wish I'd ignored, this is, this is a little bit of a controversial one. I heard a lot that title doesn't matter. This was obviously once I was into my career. It does, it does matter. That doesn't mean that the title always matters in the same way, but within an organization, a title will signal the kind of contribution they expect you to make. And so as you're forming your career, you need to look at what they want to say you do and make sure that it is what you are expecting to do, planning to do, and want to do. Mm -hmm. So it's not about always needing to have the next title up, but yeah. a title in a lot of organizations does signal what the plan for you is. Um, and I think it, it's also, it's something that I think women tend to hear a lot more than men. Title doesn't matter. It's the contribution that you make. But I do think that it's important to pay close attention to that. Um, one last thing, and this has, has nothing to do with voice, but is a technique that I have learned around negotiation that I just, I want to share with any group I get a chance to talk to. 
When I am negotiating now, I don't think about negotiating for myself, you know, for salary, for example. I think about negotiating on behalf of all of the people like me who will come after me, who may have it a little bit easier if I push harder today. And, and so that, that is definitely advice that I wish I had gotten 15 years ago, as opposed to realizing it maybe five years ago, because I think that that little mindset shift just makes a huge difference. Absolutely. How about you? It's a really great piece of advice. I love it. Yeah. I think in terms of my 15, 16 year old self, I didn't even know about these careers. I didn't even know that it was just possible. I mean, I had like three career options that my parents would sort of like, you know, I given that I'm Indian, it was sort of, I could be a lawyer, I could be a doctor, which is the number one thing, or an engineer. And the engineer really didn't fit my gender, according to my parents, you know, well, at that time, they're they're far cooler now. But I think that the thing to me is explore all of what's out there and really look deep into what is What's your passion? What do you care about? What are you interested in? And don't really necessarily think about which place you want to end up, but like the areas that you want to explore. And I think that that's really, so many of us are not going to have one career um, in in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. There's so many changing fields and interweaving fields nowadays that thinking you only have one career is probably almost, I almost think that universities have it wrong by creating these degree programs that are like just so focused right so um you have to have some depth but you also have to be thinking about what is where can you contribute and and what do you want to learn about what do you want to spend your days and nights thinking about what do you want to be obsessed about i think that's a that's a big one um the other thing is not letting others define you by those choices that you make as well and continuing to pursue because um, one of the things I really had to fight, even when I actually started this company, was um, you know people saying, "Well, you know, you come from this area or that area, or you know, um, you're is this a science project or is this actually a company?" It's just like, well, there's a lot of skills I've learned from that. There aren't, you know, you don't need to throw them out of the water just to say, okay, because I'm not twenty something starting this company that. You know, so that it doesn't mean that you haven't learned from those experiences. So sometimes age is at your advantage for things like starting a company and people think, oh, wow, those yep. super snappers can like live on a, a ramen noodle budget or whatever. But I think there's also, you know, at, regardless of where you are, experience, age, passion, those are not equivalent kinds of things. And so, um, you know, just pursue that with with the kind of grit that makes you um, excited to wake up in the morning and, 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 and do that work that you want to do every single day. I think the role modeling piece is really important and the mentorship role. Um, I've been uh, doing mentorship both you know, through the academic perspectives, but also in, in, in business now. And um, I think that that's really energizing to hear and see um, younger people, both men and women, you know, uh, in their pursuits of things that they're really passionate about. I think it's equally important for women to be role models to to men because it shows them that there are equal partners that they will have down the road as it is for women to be role models to other women. Um, I have a boy and a girl and, you know, sometimes I see that my my daughter will say they're both tennis players and one of them will say I'm a tennis player and the other one will say I play tennis and take your guess which one says I play tennis my daughter says I play tennis she doesn't say I'm a tennis player Um, that's because even the same skills oftentimes women have some difficulty sort of owning and saying that they can do that you know so that confidence that when we can build up a team of people around every single woman um, that you know, um, to say, yes, we can conquer this. I think we will have elevated the whole entire, um, you know, the, the skill set that we have that I think today there's so many women that underplay their skills and, and that's really a disservice generally, not just to themselves, but to society in general. Yep, absolutely. I, I agree a hundred percent. So this has been a super exciting conversation. I wonder if we might yeah. have almost uh, gone beyond our time. Um, it's and I possible, wanna, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, I wanna thank you, Rebecca, for for educating us and for telling us your path and, and really um, helping us uh, 
in, you know, inspire all the women in the audience today about career paths and, um, and also understanding really much more about what product management is. So thank you for your time today. Yeah, and, and thank you as well. I loved hearing uh, more about what, uh, you know, your background and what led you here with your three careers. I think that's kind of awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, we're closing things out. We're going to move over to a Q&A soon. But um, first, I would love to hear, what are you most excited about um, for the next couple of days for the Women in Voice Conference? Yes, um, I am really excited to hear all of what's been programmed. We have the programming has been really exciting in terms of all the different themes. Um, and I, I'm so excited to see the different dimensions and the people that come together, just as much from the talks as from the Q&A. I hope that we get a lot of engagement from the audience in the Q&A. And I hope that that gets people excited about the field beyond what they were today. You know, when they come into today's session, um, they probably had a certain view of what voice, uh, you know, what this conference was going to be all about. And I hope they leave with even more energy and excitement than was possible. How about you, Rebecca? Yeah. What are your so highlights? I so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the Q&A as well. I think that the best insights come when we're interactive. Um, we're getting pretty good at virtual, um, but interactive at this point. And I think, you know, it, I think we can do that. Um, I'm also personally looking forward to hearing from Carissa Merrill about inclusive practices and voice experiences. So I've actually in previous jobs spent a lot of time with WCAG guidelines, accessibility, et cetera. And connecting that with the opportunities for in inclusivity and in voice, just like we were talking about earlier, is personally super exciting to me. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you so much. Um, let's go ahead and open it up for questions now. That sounds great. Thank you. All right. All right. We're letting participants in. Hello, folks. Excited to be at the Q&A with you all. Um, two people. I'm just going to, we're, we're admitting, we're admitting the people. All right, awesome. Well, uh, great to see you all here. Um, I'm going to, um, in the chat, here is, you know, greetings from Seattle. This is Joan. Um, feel free to uh, rename yourself with your pronouns. Feel free to be off video, on video, as you wish. Um, we have our phenomenal keynotes with us today, so we're going to have an opportunity to speak with them. Um, please put your, if you've got questions or specific things, if you put them in the chat, and I'll be fielding them and sending them off. Um, but to get us all started today, um, I'm wondering if we can start with some questions about kind of actionable next steps for people who are progressing in their careers, maybe pivoting into the field. A lot of people are asking, you know, what is that concrete next thing that I can do? You know, how do I, you know, get my, get my foot in the door? Rupal, can I send this one to you? What, what kind of actionable feedback might you give to folks who are asking that today? I would say join a chapter near you of Women in Voice. I think that's one. <laughs> um, the other is, uh, I think what's really important is finding mentors and finding supporters, um, you know, early on in your career that can really shape how, um, you know, how you can be able to be exposed to a broader network than just the one that you are in. So um, I would say sort of identify one or two people. I mean, I think use your time here at Women in Voice to find those champions amongst them and the people that you're um, interested in following. And um, I think, you know, start creating that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah and I, I didn't know, I didn't pay her to say that about the Women in Voice chapters, just so everyone knows. <laughs> Rebecca? It's a wonderful idea. Um, so I, I have one additional thing to add. Everything that Ripple said, absolutely true. The other thing I think is find your why. So um, I think a critical part of crafting your career is knowing what inspires you and what makes you most interested and excited. And it's something that there have been times over the course of my career that I lost my why. And those were the times when I did most poorly in my career, honestly. And refinding that why is what fired me up again. So think about your why. Don't just think about it in terms of getting a job. Think about it in terms of finding a place that lets you build on that why, whatever it is that you are most passionate about that matters most to you. That's awesome, great, great answers. Well, and we're getting some uh, messages in the chat. I've got one um, around brand and kind of 
I think both, both of you are so well pedigreed, it's hard to maybe talk about this, but kind of thinking of, you know, is it really important? I think the, the question is asking, does it matter where you studied from? Do you need certain brand names on your resume to make that next step forward? You know, I think a lot of people might be thinking about certificates or kind of workshops of, of how to build that portfolio. Um, what might you say of, or I, I think, well, Rupal, I'm gonna hint to the folks, I think you're hiring, you know, how much does it matter what, what's on their resume as far as like brand names, brand, brand names, <laughs> proverbial way. Um, how does that matter as compared to different skill sets that people can bring to the table? Well, I think, yeah. you know, I, I studied in the US, in Canada. And for me, I feel like I don't quite understand some of like the brand name stuff in the US. Because <laughs> um, I do think that there is some distinction here. But I think we're a really international community. So really what matters is what kind of work you've done and what your passion is about. I mean, most people, these fields didn't exist so long ago. And so there aren't really career paths in many of these areas that are well, like, you know, sketched out. Um, so a lot of it is really uh, figuring out ways to describe kind of what Rebecca was saying earlier about what is, what are you passionate about? Why do you want to be here? That's the biggest question I ask is why here? Um, versus somewhere else and also you know what is it that you're going to contribute how do you think you can be part of this team and how will it be bigger than just the sum of its parts absolutely rebecca yeah so i think first off no pedigree generally doesn't matter provided you can show smart gets things done passionate like Rupal was saying um now that said i will say one of the reasons that i i um, went to business school at Carnegie Mellon was to develop the tech cred that i didn't have from my undergraduate degree and it did help and so sometimes if you think about what in particular you might feel like you're missing in my case there was that one thing that the tech credibility um think about how that might be something that you can fix and what is the point solution there? My point solution, obviously two years of business school, that's a fairly large fairly large point, but um, it was what really got me past that tech credibility um, uh, hurdle. Absolutely, and I think it's also interesting that y'all are talking about kind of maybe I heard feedback that this is something I'm missing in my portfolio or even to, you know, if you consistently hear the same gaps to really hear that constructive feedback and, and to move on. Ripple, did you have another thing to add about that one? I just wanted to add um, that in this world of voice, I think, um, well, in anything that has to do with sort of multidisciplinary, creating a portfolio of your work um, and, and not only here's the work, but here's why and here's what I would maybe do differently next time. It shows that you're a learner, you know, that you're in a growth mindset. And I think that's a really important piece as well. So that and a lot of times now people are looking at the portfolios because the degrees don't necessarily differentiate people, but it's what you do with it and how you've applied it. That's really important. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. All right. We got a question. I want to let people in the chat know we have four minutes left. This is a really fast one. So if you've got a question, please pose it. Um, Shar asks, you know, what does grit mean to you and how important is it to success in the voice industry or kind of, I think, in careers in general? Rebecca, can I start with you about grit? Uh, so um, I, I am a big fan of grit. Grit is what got my son to finally learn to ride a bike yesterday. Yes. <laughs> um, it took a while. Um, I think that, you know, what grit boils down to is treating failure as a learning opportunity. And it's becoming overused at this point in some ways. And I think it's being twisted. But being able to pick yourself up and say, wow, what can I get from what just happened that went terribly wrong? That is a critical attribute for anyone in any situation. It's not just a professional attribute. And, and so I think, you know, I, I once uh, was interviewing for a job and they asked me, you know, what was your biggest failure? At the time, I didn't answer very well. I have a very long list of them now as I've, you know, learned how to embrace the failures and to treat them in a way that doesn't push them towards the back of my mind, but keeps them at the front of my mind as a chance to become better. Uh, so, you know, it's not specific to the voice industry, honestly. I think it's specific to any part of your life in any situation. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, reframing failure, or I think our, our society is so binary, right? Either you succeed or you fail. It, it feels really strong. And I think to learn from those things and see what didn't work, because it's like a, something of, of madness is doing the same thing, expecting a different response. So learning to yep. iterate and grow from these different pieces. Awesome. 
Um, if you've got questions for, okay, <laughs> we're plugging things for Vocal ID. Awesome. Well, we've got two minutes left. Um, anyone else from the crowd want to ask a question? We've got so many folks here. Um, I think if I'll, if I'll use the last two minutes to talk about, I think, uh, Rebecca, you talked about your why and kind of knowing your decision points. Are there different um, times that you, either of you, have had times where you're like trying to decide amongst different paths? and how you made some of those decisions. Because I think a lot of people, right, especially during the pandemic, otherwise are making some of those choices and trying to define <laughs> why this path, why not that path. Rupal, would you mind going for this one? Oh boy, there's so many intersections, I think, um, in careers and in, in life. Um, and it's really assessing those um, and, and knowing that you can go back. Um, I think no path traveled is necessarily one where you can't follow back and go down a different path again. Um, so I think it's really important to understand that obviously decisions sometimes, you know, some of them are, are for a long time, but um, there are always ways to, uh, to change things if they're not working and leaving yourself that freedom, I think is really, really important. Um, yeah, Rebecca, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. So I think for me, thinking about, so a couple of things. First off, for career decisions, thinking about whether the career choice you're making sets you up well for the next career choice is a really critical thing um, to think about. You know, as it's a wonderful quote from a friend of mine who, um, who is over at Facebook now. When I was looking at the Google opportunity, she said, Google is a great place to be from. <laughs> It's like, that's true. I'm loving what I'm doing, but it's also a great place to be from. It sets me up for that next step. And so I think considering that, that you know, a couple of paths down the road is really critical, but also what makes you smile when you think about it? What makes you feel as if any weight that's on your shoulders is getting a little bit lighter? That also is a critical thing to think about. Don't just think about what you should be doing. Think about what makes your heart sing. Um, and I know I sound kind of hippy dippy when I say this, but I really think that people do their best work when they find something that does make them smile and make them really engaged. Oh, what a great answer and what a great place to end on. Uh, if you all are feeling like me, you want more of this, um, but but we got to move on. Um, speaking of amazing work, um, thank you so much to our keynotes because everyone, those are on the screen. Thank you so much to our keynotes for the fabulous discussion. Um, we're going off to our next talks. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, let's see, I don't, I don't know if everyone gets bounced from this or we'll see you back in the Whova app. Um, I'll be at the Magenta one with our Dutch Telecom. Uh, cheers everybody, uh, talk soon. Uh, let's see, and so, Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Um, Maddie, I think we're just all going back in, in Whova if people are. Yes, we'll see you in Whova. Go, go to right. the agenda to find your next session. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.